James chapter 5, verse 13. The Bible says this. If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. If anyone, is anyone cheerful, let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. 17 says Elijah was a man with the nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced fruits. Anytime you want the earth to produce fruits, ask for the rain. That is not my theme today, but most of you are going through a season where there's no fruit and you're concentrating so much on the earth. The Holy Spirit is saying, if you want the earth to produce fruits, what you do is pray for the rain. Amen? How many of you have ever been praying and, and, and you feel like your prayer is not working? Let, let me see your hand. Like it's not, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. You feel like it just, it's, it's hitting the ceiling and coming back. Like you pray, pray after one hour, you're like, this stuff didn't, I don't think, he, even me, if I was God, I don't think, I don't think I heard. Today we're going to talk about how to pray effective prayers, how to pray prayers that work, how to pray prayers that work. Let us pray. Father, thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. As, as your word comes, it falls on hearts that are ready to receive. I take charge of this atmosphere. I take charge of this atmosphere and I say this atmosphere belongs to you. This room, this school, this county, this city, we take charge right now and we say your word is going to go forth, it's going to produce in mass. Our lives are going to be changed as a result of what we shall learn at your feet today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm about to date myself. Um, but yeah, I don't care. You know what I mean? I don't care. When I was growing up, we had a um, black and white TV. Now, for some of you, you cannot comprehend what I'm saying. For some of you, black and white is a filter. It's an effect. It's something we intentionally do, you know what I mean? To add some verve to, <laughs> to a video or a picture, you know what I mean? I lived in a time where um, when black and white TV was all they were, you know, like, it's like you're watching a game and the grass is gray. The human beings are a, a, a mismatch, just mismatch of gray and black and all kinds of things. And that was the reality we knew until one day my dad came back from work with this um, Sanyo cabinet TV. Now, again, most of you don't. <laughs> most of you don't understand what miracle that was. So this TV looked like a cabinet. It was so good, it, you, you, you could, um, it, 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 could, it, it could close. The front could close. Then it had a key, which my parents were too excited to use. Like it's, we found a way around it. Mom and dad, I know they're watching. We found a way around it. We watched TV when you were gone. But <laughs> it had its own stand, wooden stand, wooden cabinet thing, humongous box, little TV in there, but humongous this speaker and everything. It was, it was innovative because um, when you put it on, the grass was green. There was yellow, there was red, there was purple. We were so enamored by the color that we sat, sat down and watched those S, STMPE bars, the color bars, <laughs> like that happened before um, television programming began for the day. Again, television programming, you're wondering, was there a time TV was not working? Yes. In the morning, there was no TV working. Human beings went to work. <laughs> Then they came back and let's say by four or five, TV began to work. So there was really nothing to do than play, play outside. That play outside thing was not because the kids wanted to play outside, it's because there was nothing to do inside. So they went outside. So 
The TV, amazing. Now, all of this is nice. Color is nice. Covering for my parents, awesome. The stand, awesome. Close the filmmaking cabinet. You can put some flour there. Amazing. The revolution was this. It had a remote control. Again, most of you cannot imagine a world. You control your TV with your phone now. Then, if you needed to change the station, you ask yourself, is it that important? Can I just manage this instead of making my way all the way to the TV? You had a remote control and it was mind blowing. You could sit on the couch and just, ah, pow, and change the channel or increase the volume. Incredible. Our excitement did not last long because then we realized that <clears throat> the remote control had to be directly <laughs> in front of the TV, pointing at this little zone they, they targeted. Little zone that had like a red. When you press it, it will show red there, an infrared thing. I know it's not about infrared. Infrared, you have to be exact. So our uh, joy was short-lived because not every seat faced the TV directly. So uh, you had to fight to be in the seat that faced the TV directly so that they gave you the remote control. So in the morning, TV programming starts by 4. By 1 p.m., people are on the couch trying to say. <laughs> you can't imagine. This was my childhood. And you will eat lunch and you will sit down there and you will wait for a time when they give you the remote control because only you can control the volume, the everything, the brightness, the contrast. Contrast. What? Yes. These were new things to us. And you would try and then we realized, no, you, you can't just, you can't even be too far away from the TV. As remote control as it was, does not really, it was remote, but not in the sense we understand it now. And sometimes it will work and sometimes it will not work. And then some of us just grew impatient and we just stand up and walk up to the TV and change the channel. But I feel like some of our prayer life is like that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. You're like, am I, am I aiming it just right? Is the remote headed to heaven? Maybe there's a bird that is blocking my signal or maybe this rain cloud. We just feel prayer is not working. And I have some good news for you. We are not the only ones that had these problems. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, we see Jesus praying. The Bible says, now it came to pass as he was praying, that is Christ, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he ceased, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. I, if, if I was to look at it in my own way, I, I think it happened this way. They were all praying. Jesus was praying and they were attempting to pray. And then they realized, no, this guy's prayer is different from my own. Uh, the way his own is going is not the way my own is going. And somebody walked up like, you know, finally, just, sorry, just teach us to pray. Like those of them that were John disciples that are here with us now, they pray different. I don't know how to pray. So we are not alone. This is not a question that is happening just to 21st century believers. We see even the disciples had the same problems. They did not feel they knew how to pray. Then Jesus goes on and says this in verse 2. He said to them, when you pray, say. Let's pause there. That word say is lego. Lego means this. Lego means to point out with words, to intend to mean, to mean to say. Jesus was saying, whenever you are praying, make sure you mean this. Make sure you pray from this posture. Make sure this is the posture of your heart. Make sure this is the point you're trying to make. Jesus wasn't saying, pray exactly these words. He was not saying, pray, God, our Father who art in heaven, you're going to see that. He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. Jesus was not saying, pray exactly those words. You can pray those words, but that word lego means intend this. How do I know this? There are many kinds of prayer in the Bible. There's a prayer of supplication. There's a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of agreements. There's a prayer of worship and adoration. There's a prayer of consecration, intercession, imprecation. There's a prayer of lament, a prayer of blessing. There's a prayer that's praying in the spirit. There are prophetic prayers, the spiritual warfare, all kinds of prayers. Jesus is saying, no matter what kind of prayer you're praying, maintain this posture. Intend this. 
This is not a message where I'm going to analyze the Lord's Prayer. Maybe at some point I will, but this is not the message for that. But if you look at the, the Lord's Prayer, there are some postures that Jesus was suggesting. Number one, he was saying pray from a posture of a personal relationship with God. Our Father who art in heaven, pray from a personal relationship knowing that you have a heavenly Father. Why is this important? The Bible says in Luke chapter 3 that when the people were being baptized, Jesus came to be baptized by John the Baptist. And the Bible says as he was being baptized, while he prayed, the heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice from heaven came down saying, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, let's just go there for a very brief minute. When you pray with an understanding of that God is your father, three things happen. Number one, the heaven opens over you. Number two, you have the Holy Spirit descends. There is a supply of the spirits that is given to you. And number three, you hear the voice of God. So if you're looking to hear the voice of God, you have to engage God as a father. Jesus is saying, begin with this, with your relationship with him. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I call this the hug and the bow of prayer because you're saying, our father who art in heaven and you're hugging him and then you have to bow, hallowed be your name. That's the tension of prayer that sometimes we miss. Sometimes we approach God with a posture that takes him for granted. Yes, I'm intimate with him. Yes, he is my father. Yes, he is my Lord. Yes, he is all of this to me, but I have to have reverence for him. So I can hug him and then I can bow to him. He has to also have a, a posture of alignment. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Which means my agenda, which means my will comes second to yours. Uh, that's the difficult part of prayer because most of us go to prayer with our ambition and God becomes our bellboy, uh, our, our door dash deliverer and we're wondering why haven't you brought the answers to what I prayed for? No, the prayer begins um, at some point you have to say, I lay down why I came to you in the first place. Yeah. And I'm asking your kingdom come. There has to be a posture of dependence on him. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not just talking about um, um, physical nourishment. It's also um, spiritual nourishment. How do I know this? Jesus told the devil, man shall not live by bread alone. And then he likens bread to the word of God. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So I'm depending on God for my daily and my, my daily physical and spiritual nourishment. I'm also committing to extend the same grace that I experience to other people. Forgive me as I forgive those who trespass against me. I'm committing not only to enjoy your grace, I'm committing to extending it also. Then the Bible says, I have to depend on him not to lead me into temptation. Don't give me much more than I can bear. Deliver me from the plans of the enemy. The, 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 the other book, I think in Matthew says, thy, thy kingdom come. For thine is thy kingdom, the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. The point is, is, Jesus was saying, no matter what kind of prayer you're praying, this is the posture I want you to have. If we're honest with ourselves, we, 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 we miss the first line. The first line says, our father who art in heaven. That's the primary purpose of prayer. The primary purpose of prayer is to engage with a person in the context of a place. Let me say that again. The primary intention of prayer is to engage with a person in the context of a place. Is to engage with a father in context of a place, heaven. Is to engage with a king in context of a place, his kingdom. Is to engage with a father in the context of his desires. Prayer is the major way, is a major way that heaven intersects with earth. So if I want heaven, if I want an interruption of heaven in my affairs, what do I do? I pray. <laughs> Prayer is interacting with a person according to the dictates or in, within the context of a place. Prayer is approaching a king in the light of the glory of his dominion. Prayer is connecting with a father, which is desire for us and the earth at large. Because sometimes we go to God in prayer and we don't understand that sometimes some things happen that bring us to God to deal with other things in our lives. 
You're having an issue looking for a job and you think it's just about the job, but there's some pride. God is trying to work on the inside of you. So he, he, he lets that happen for a while until you come to your knees and then you, he begins to work on your heart and he begins to deal with some things on the inside of you. And then you go, well, I, I, I just came to ask for a job, I know. Now that you're on the table, can we deal with that selfishness real quick? Because it's about his agenda. So the purpose of prayer is connecting with God to discover and to realize his agenda in your life and on the earth. Let me say that again. The purpose of prayer is connecting with God to discover and to realize his agenda on the earth. His agenda in your life and his agenda in the earth. So no matter what kind of prayer we're praying, Jesus is saying, have this posture that begins with what? Our Father who art in heaven. I have a clear, vivid revelation of the fact that I am a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I have a clear revelation that God is my father and he's in heaven. That means my answer is going to come from heaven. It's not going to come from man. Even if he uses man, heaven has to touch a man for, for, for that man to do what they have to do for me. So it directs your eyes up to heaven already. But if we're honest, even though there are many kinds of prayer, I'm coming, I'm going to teach you how to pray effective prayers. We really want to learn how to pray the prayer of supplication and petition. The one where I get to ask God for what I want and then he gives it to me. All this other intercession and all this other ones. Awesome. But Pastor Vic, teach me the one where I want something. <laughs> then I ask him and then he gives it to me. If we're honest, all this English I've been speaking, how do I get the job? <laughs> That's where James chapter 5 comes in handy. The Bible says in James chapter 5 verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. That is awesome. That's what James says. You can actually lay hands on yourself. Jesus updated that and said you can lay hands on the sick, including yourself, and they will recover. But he's saying here, if you are suffering, if you are sick, then you should pray. If you are sick, then you should pray. If you are suffering, then you should pray. If you are suffering under the weight of something that you don't like, James is saying, what should you do? Pray. It does not say, if you are suffering, post about it. It does not say, if you are suffering, comment about it. It does not say, if you are suffering, complain about it. It does not say, if you are suffering, have a bad attitude about it. James is saying, if you are suffering, do what? Pray. Pray. We can go home. <laughs> Pray. That's what it says. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Be anxious for not... Okay. This is my problem with the pandemic of anxiety. Take We're online, so got to be careful. Okay, I'm going to be honest. I, I owe you that. Um, we treat anxiety as if we're helpless to it. Now, if it's not a chemical anxiety, people have chemical anxiety where they cannot help it like this. The way that's a, a sickness you can pray for. The Bible says if you're sick, pray, you can pray for that. But most of the psychosomatic anxiety is our posture of helplessness to it. Jesus. James did not, um, Philippians or Paul did not say, um, pray that God removes the anxiety. He says, be anxious for nothing. He's saying it is within your power uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. to choose not to be anxious. Uh, it's, it's, it's Paul that said this stuff. Do not, don't email me, text me, DM me. <laughs> Paul that said it. He said, but in everything, what should you do like Jem said? By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. So James says, if you're suffering, what should you do? Pray. Paul is saying, if, don't be anxious. First of all, just overcome the anxiety and come to him in prayer. So it, it's important that we have to understand, if I have a problem, my first instinct should be to pray. 
Go back to James and verse 15 says this, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and, and, he, and he that has committed sins, he will be forgiven, um, confess your sins one to another. That's why you should be in a group. That confession there is not a confession for forgiveness. It's a confession for healing. Healing means I can be restored. Somebody can hold me accountable for doing better than I was doing before. That's not forgiveness of sin. That's healing where somebody can be your friend and you said, you're not going to watch it again. You're not going to go there again. And you tell them, let me confess to you. Last Wednesday, I went there. I don't want to do it again. So don't worry. I can walk with you until you are healed. That's why you should be in a small group. The ultimate, let me give you the ultimate goal as a Christian, that your vacation friends and your church friends are the same. Because most of you be going on, on vacation and believing another life. <laughs> Pastor Vic. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, let's come back. James continues and then he drums this little clause there in verse 16. He says this. The, the New King James puts it this way. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Uh, uh, the effectual the King James puts that effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We have long, and this is the problem we've had with prayer, we have treated effectual, fervent, like an adjective that modifies the noun prayer. So this is the character of the prayer that avails much. It has to be effectual and it has to be fervent. Ah, let me break it to you. The word effectual fervent is a compound word in the Greek. It's one word. And that word is not an adjective. It's a verb. It's an action. That means there are things you do that can be characterized as effectual fervent. That word in the Greek means to be operative. Means to be at work. It means to be active, to put forth power. Effective, or effectual fervent means I'm active. It's working. The prayer has to work. Avail it much. Avail there means to be strong. That means, in simple English, the prayer has to work before it works. Okay, I lost some of you. Okay. Effectual fervent means the prayer is operational. It's like a, 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 a machine that produces power. Let's say the power goes off and we have a generator. And then we have to get the generator working before it can produce light. So some of you are waiting for your prayer to avail much. Meanwhile, the generator is not on. So James is saying, put on the generator, get it working. Then you will have light. So the reason why your prayer has not worked is because you've been looking at the light. Why isn't this light working? What is happening? There is darkness in my life. God, where are you? God is like, um, your generator is not on. But I have a generator. Awesome. Thank you for that. It's not working, but I prayed all through last night. Amazing. It was not working. It was not operational. You have to get it working. The operational prayer of the righteous person has the ability to do much. The active prayer of the righteous person. Righteousness is not a problem. As long as you're a child of God, that is not the issue. Well, I do not, I say that that's not the issue. Righteousness is a gift. It is given to you. It's not about what you did. It's about what some other person did and somebody just gave it to you. It's like a car. Somebody gives you the car. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to pay for it. All you have to do is just accept it. So righteousness is not a problem there. The problem is effectual fervent. Most of our prayers are not functional. They're not operative. If I lived you here, I'll be a wicked person. Because then the question then becomes, how? <laughs> if we're honest, this is how we pray. We have a need. Then we complain about it. We talk to somebody, post this um, PT, PT post on IG. 
where you, you post. It's not really sad, but it suggests <laughs> sadness. <laughs> so people can DM you, how, how are you doing? <laughs> are you okay? I'm praying for you. Half the time they are not praying for you. I'm praying for you. We complain about it. Then we say something negative that agrees with the, the, the problem. And for some of you, you're in internet warriors. You get the diagnosis and then you go to WebMD. Sarcoma. Ah! I'm dying. Because it says death here. And we go on the internet. And then when we have saturated ourselves with all that information, then, oh, God, that's true. God, this is your child. <laughs> And then when God is, is too slow doing it, we come back and then we look for options. And then it blows up in our face and we're back again. God, is your son. Victor, will you, you say you'll never leave me or forsake me. But you left and you forsook. But now it's, it's God. And we recycle that until something happens. Or the most dangerous of this is we settle for the predicament because it might be the will of God. I'm sorry. So how, I think the question is, how do we then effectively pray? Number one, step number one, pray first. That's good. That's so good. Pray first. If anyone is sick among you, it doesn't say, let him post, then pray. Let him complain, then pray. Let him grumble, then pray. He says, if anyone is sick among you, let him pray. Amen. The first thing, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 says, the first thing I want you to do is pray. Pray first. Come to God with it. And don't just come complaining. Come to God with thanksgiving and praise. The Bible says, our oh, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Like, I know I have problems. I know I have challenges. I know, I, I know things are not going well, but let me just praise you for a bit. What does that do for you, for your soul? It begins to focus your soul on God and your problems. Because if you have to, if you have to force your soul, your mind, to pray, you, you have to take it away. You cannot focus on your problems and praise at the same time. So you want to put all your energy for just a bit. I know, I know, I just got the bad news. But hallowed be your name. Thank you for being a good father. Thank you for your faithfulness. Your Some of you need to increase your praise vocabulary. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's not, when you fall in love, you can tell her, you're, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> You're fine. See how fine you are. Your dress is fine. Your earrings are fine. Your hair is... Use other adjectives. Come on, man. Like, shower love on him. Rose of Sharon. I mean, bright and morning star. Get, get creative. Force yourself to get creative in your praise. No, no, you are the God that never fails. Oh, he knows that one. <laughs> oh, Pastor Victor, relax. Not, not, not only are you coming with thanksgiving and praise, you're coming with an understanding that Satan has already been defeated. You're not asking God to go to war with Satan. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 that God disarmed principalities and powers and made a bold display no, not, so he did not defeat the devil in secret. Right. And then you have to find out if, he, if the devil is defeated. No, when, when God embarrassed the devil, he posted about it. Like he, he made it known to everybody that the devil is defeated. The que okay, okay, this is not the message. But the question is, are you subscribed to Jesus? Because if you're subscribed to Jesus, you would have gotten the alert that the devil has been defeated. So you approach God with the conviction 
The devil has already won. The thing about devil, devil doesn't play and John like, like with the war rules. They're like rules of engagement in war. You don't um, kill the kids and you don't kill trees. There are all kinds of things you don't do. He's your eighth the terrorist. You don't care about the nonsense regulations. The devil doesn't care that he's been defeated. He's going to try to see if you know that he's defeated. And like I say, your ignorance is the devil's playground. Most of you have given him a whole field to play with based on how ignorant you are about what is yours. So you come to God like devil has already been defeated. You come to God knowing that God can do anything. Luke chapter 1 verse 37 says, For with God, nothing is ever impossible. So that means prayer becomes a, a, an expression, a manifestation of my hope and my confidence in God. I pray to God because I believe that he can do anything. Don't you anyone say pray first. Now most of you are not saying it. So don't you anyone say pray first. Don't worry about it. Say don't worry about it. Don't post about it. Don't seek sympathy. Pray about it. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, it says, do not give the devil a foothold. Let me apply it to this. When you delay in praying first, you give the devil space to fill your mind. Most of us, prayer is difficult for most of us because we spend the initial parts of our prayer reclaiming the territory that we lost to the devil because of the delay in praying to God. Most of us have difficulty in prayer and the first initial energy you generate in your first parts of your prayer is just to reclaim the territory of your mind, the territory of your peace, the territory of your confidence that you left to the devil because you wasted time in praying to God. So you hear about the diagnosis and you go to the internet. And guess what? Once you browse it, Instagram has lots of suggestions for you. Are you suffering from a, a, a back pain? Here are 72 ways you can cure. <laughs> Here are the five things it could be, including death. Like when you're done, two hours later, you are so scared for your life that when you go to pray, the first parts of your prayer is dealing with the fear, not even the sickness, just getting back to zero. That's why James said, if you are sick, pray. Paul says to Timothy, I want you to pray first. So number one, pray first. Number two, feed your faith. Feed your spirit, feed your faith with the word of God. Search the scriptures for people who have gone through what you're going through. Read their stories. Get to, well, we're going to get into a season of telling stories in our church of people's steps because we have lots of testimonies. People that went to get a job and, and they had a, a, a amount of money they were believing God for. I just, heard, just read about this amount of money they were believing God for and they went there and they offered them um, below that amount. And they were about to accept and they realized, no, 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 no. I prayed for this amount. And they believed God and they went back and they offered them more than the amounts that they prayed for. You hear those stories and you go to the Bible and you search the scriptures and just begin to feed your faith. Most of us know more about what the internet says about our predicament than what the word of God says about it. You know more about what, what WebMD says about it than what the Bible says about it. Feed your faith. Feed your spirit. Don't research the problem until you have a firm grip on the word of God concerning it. They tell you you have a diagnosis. Oh, you have leukemia. Let all you know about leukemia be all you know about leukemia now. Go to God. Father, I thank you. You are wonderful. You are beautiful. Aren't you a healer? Is there no balm in Gilead? Are you not God again all by yourself? Look at you. You make the you begin to shout praise on him. Five minutes later, you forget you have a diagnosis. Then you go to the scripture. Lord, I have this thing, but I'm going to read about the wonderful things that you have done already. See how you, you didn't even have to look at the woman with the issue of blood. You were headed in the other direction and she came from behind you. And yet I have a relationship with you where I can see you face to face. That means for me, it is better than she had it. You're playing around it. 
You're reading the scripture. You're just reading. You're building your faith. Then you begin to develop a confession that keeps you focused and sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. From those scriptures, just develop a confession about what you want to see God do. This is the first of confessions that you're going to have. But you begin to aggregate all this information, all this revelation of what God has done in other people's lives and you begin to aggregate them into a confession that you say to yourself. And why are you saying that to yourself? You want to focus your attention. This is what I'm believing God to do in my life. You want to leave yourself uh, uh, um, sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is doing. You want to shape your expectation so that you don't settle for anything less than what you're saying. And uh, well, we have this building confession, and we're going to do it before the sir, before the message. I said, no, well, let's let, let me show you why we do what we do. When we have this building confession, every 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 month we talk about it. At some point, we're saying it every Sunday, and it shapes our expectation. If you have the building confession, I'd like to do. It. We're all going to say it, and I'm going to show you what it does. Everybody, one, two, ready, go. As I walk into church. We see other members of our church family from diverse creeds and backgrounds still admiring our new church facility. Everything looks beautiful and clean. Let's say it. And the restrooms smell amazing. Visitors say it's easily accessible and identifiable. Kids eagerly leave their parents' side because their space looks so much fun. It's like they're in Disney. The people are warm like in Chick-fil-A. The atmosphere is electric like the Super Bowl and expectation is high just like lunch Sunday but even better. Every week we sit beside friends who can't wait to share their stories of growth, fruitfulness and multiplication. Every week we are only limited by space and time because every seat has been taken as we fill every space we occupy Every week, thousands of people are drawn to God and encounter Jesus in our new church facility. Every week, we cannot wait to invite somebody we know to experience what God is doing at the well. Oh, I love my church and I'm excited about what God is doing at the well. Now, most of you are not excited, but that stuff gets me pumped up. Why? I will not rest until the toilet smell amazing. It shapes your expectation. God, this is what I want to happen in our new church facility. You aggregate it. You, you begin to just draw from all kinds of stories. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Not the diagnosis, not the research, not what other people are saying, not the expert's opinion. Let the word dwell in you richly. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. That means your words and your thoughts can either fuel or fight your faith. You can say, I'm praying about it, but every other word that comes out of your mouth goes against what you're praying about. And I told you, every word you say is either a prayer to God or a prayer to the enemy. And the devil answers prayers. When you say it, you give him the legal rights to enforce it in your life. When you say, this headache is going to kill me, you'll be like, God, she said it. She said the headache, and I quote, is going to kill me. And then he goes on to try, try to kill you because you said the headache is going to kill me. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the, the tongue. Come on, come on. So you said, I'm going to die looking for this job. He said he's going to die looking for the job. You know you cannot stop me. He said so. Your son said, this is how he's going to die, looking for the job. And then you wonder why your life is the way it is. Jesus. I pray that I've been praying about it, Pastor Vic. What have you been saying in between the prayers? Yeah. Because that also is prayer. The most critical part of prayer is drawing close and staying, drawing nearer and staying close to the source of your solution. That's why you're praising. That's why you're praying. That's why you're studying the word. You want to stay close to where you're going to get the answer from. If, if you've ever tried to book a ride with Uber or, or with Lyft and, you, and you're far from where you said you want to be picked up from, they usually have this thing where they ask you, hey, it seems as if you're far from where you want to be picked up. Are you sure that's where you want to be picked up from? 
And I actually ask you to confirm again this address. You say you want to pick it up here. It looks like you're 15 minutes away, but you say you want to, and maybe you're just trying to, to, to make the plans. He says, just confirm this address again. And I actually sometimes give you a pin. Drag this pin again to where you want me to come and pick you from. All of this is an attempt to make sure that when the person comes, when the driver comes, you are ready to be there. Most of us have ordered something from God. And then we moved away from where we say we're going to be when the answer is going to come. So you were praying and your prayer life went from a level five to a level eight. Guess where your answer is? If you come down from level eight, your answer is waiting for you on level, on, on level eight. It's waiting there. It's waiting for you where you activated the answer. So most of us pray about something and we go back to complain and then the angel comes with the answer and they're like, where, where is this guy? Thought, did you say he's going to be in church today? You said today, right? Ju July 2nd. Yeah, he's not in church. He's not where he said he's going to be. She's not where she said he's going to be. And most of us have missed out on angelic activity because you gave up the problem. Okay. Daniel was praying and the Bible says God answered him the very first day. And it took 21 days for the angels to do all the things they had to do and convert the prince of Persia and all of that. Guess where they found Daniel on day 21? Come on, come on. Where he was on day one. Most, most of us pray on day one and by day seven you're like, okay, yeah, like this. <laughs> this must be the will of God because... Pastor Victor has prayed about it. Pastor Ambi has prayed about it. No, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not working. Then you leave where you're supposed to be. That's why you study. That's why you say these confessions. It reminds you of what you're believing God for. So you pray first. You feed your faith. And this is the part we miss. Because it's in this part where you're reading the word of God and feeding your faith and keeping your spirit sensitive to what the Holy Spirit wants to say. That you begin to hear the word of God. Step number three, you listen for God's voice. This is when things begin to become specific, but this is where most of us miss it. The Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2, 1 to 2, I will climb up on, upon, upon my watchtower, up to my watchtower, and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says. Uh, I could preach that for a while. There I will wait to see. That seems wrong. God is talking. What does it say? Well, I get to hear what he's saying. Because when God talks, it comes to you as light. You see what he's saying. The word of God creates pictures in your mind. He wants you to see the fulfillment of what he's saying. He told Joshua, Joshua, Joshua chapter 6. He says, see, I've given you this land. Open your eyes and see that what I'm saying is already happening. It has happened already. I just need you to receive it. It already belongs to you. He says, I will see what the Lord will say and how he will answer my, my complaints. Number two, then the Lord said to me, where did God speak to him? At the watch post on the tower where he was praying, where he was expectant. That's where God speaks. We pray to hear. We pray to see. We don't pray to complain. The goal of prayer is to hear and to see what God wants to do. Until you get to that point, you have not yet prayed. Prayer is not a complaint session when you just dump all your care. I know it says cast all your cares upon the Lord. That's just the beginning. For he cares. That's the way out of anxiety. Cast it on him. They say you have something, just drop it there and leave. He did not say, gently drop at his feet. No, he says, cast it and walk out. Say so you have leukemia. I'm out. I am healed. And I'm taking that. That's what I'm taking. I'm not taking this leukemia. I'm not taking whatever they, you drop it there and you walk out. Then you pray about it. And you keep praying until, there are two words in the Greek that are used for the word of God. Logos and Rhema. Logos is, the, is a general word of God. The Bible is the Logos, the general counsel. Um, Rhema is the specific word of God. Um, Bill Harmon, Dr. Bill Harmon puts it this way. Logos is the general word of God that communicates his ability to do something. That's why you read the stories of people who have gone through that. Or his general will or a matter on a matter. And while Rema is the word of God that the Holy Spirit quickens 
to a specific person for a specific situation. The Logos might be a well of water. The Rema is the cup you draw for yourself. Logos can be a buffet. Rema is the food you actually eat out of the buffet. Logos are the seats in this auditorium. Rema is the one you're sitting on. So as you're reading, I like the way the vines, the, 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 the dictionary oh, 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 um, says it. It says this. Rema is the individual scripture which, which the Spirit brings to our remembrance for use in time of need. A prerequisite. Being the regular storing of the mind with scripture. That means Logos prepares me for the Rima. Most of you are looking to hear what God has to say in your specific circumstance, but you don't know what the general will of God is for you. God, should I marry him? No, let's, before we go to marrying him, let's go to what the word of God says about marriage as a whole. And if I should even be coming to him about this. Good. God, should I get that job? Let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about productivity and about the works of your hands. First, before you know if that job is for you, Logos prepares you to discern what the will of God is specifically for you. This is the step that most of us miss that doesn't make your prayer effective. Look at Moses. Moses was about to, to, to give water. The Israelites had no water. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 17, the first time that they had this problem, God told him, strike the rock. Strike it. Second time, God told him, speak to the rock. That is confusing. Why? Because I struck it the first time it worked. Why wouldn't you let me just strike it? So most of us do this. Prayer number one, scenario, strike the rock. Pow! Psh, water. Mm, you won. Then you have the similar circumstance. You don't go through Logos Arema anymore. You believe that because I struck the rock the first time and water came out and now I need water and there is a rock and there is a rod. Ah, strike. Ask Moses what happened to him when he struck the second time. When God told him, this time around I want you to speak. Because God is not obligated to do it the same way he did it every time. That's the rhema. God gave him the specificity of instructions. The Bible says that faith, Romans chapter 10 verse 17, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That word there is rhema. It's not logos. Your faith does not grow because of the general counsel of God. Your faith does not grow because of the general Bible that you're reading. Your faith comes. Faith, it comes. That means there can be a time where there's no faith. What brings faith is when you download the word of God specific to your circumstance. That's when faith comes. The Bible says, faith comes when I hear what God wants to do in this particular time, this season, this particular circumstance. Moses stands in front of the Red Sea. God says, why, why, why are you crying? Ask the people to move forward, hold up your rod. He did exactly that. Boom. There was, there was a way in the sea. Joshua stands in front of Jericho. God says, go around it one time for six days. On the seventh day, go, go around it seven times. He does exactly that. Boom. It happens for him. Naaman is sick. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 5, he goes to the prophet and says, hey, I want to be healed. Prophet says, go to um, um, the Jordan River and dip there seven times, seven times, not six times, not eight times, not five times, dip there seven times. That's the instruction from God because it's in the place of prayer that one, we receive insight from God. Something I did not know before, I begin to know. I've taught you that the number one prayer you should pray in every circumstance is, Lord, open my eyes. What am I missing? There's something I'm not seeing. So the first thing you get is insight. The second thing you get is instruction from God. Usually, I know we don't like this, it's going to be instruction on your love walk. Yeah. Somebody you're not treating right. Somebody you should show more honor to. Somebody should show more love to. Somebody you should forgive. You're like, no, but Pastor Vic, Pastor Vic, if you know what they did to me, even you will shoot them for me. <laughs> and that might just be what they'll be like, uh, God will be like, yeah, I want you to, to do this. Your consecration. God might begin to demand more of you, something that kills your flesh even more. 
That's where you get what God wants from you. That's where you get what to obey. Like all these people I give examples from. Go and dip in the river. Go and call your boss. Go text that person. He begins to give you actions. The most important thing I think you get is the I will of God. What God is saying he's going to do. Ezekiel chapter 37 is incredible for this. It says this. The hand of the Lord came upon me. This is Ezekiel saying this. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in, a, in the midst of a valley and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass around them. Behold, there were very many and in an open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. Then he said to me, so Ezekiel is faced with a problem, and then God tells him this. Um, Son of man, can these bones live again? There are two ways that you get into prayer. Either you have a need, or God puts a burden in your heart. Like you're just by yourself, and then you have a burden to pray for somebody. If you ever wake up in the night, and you have a burden to pray for somebody, I beg you in the name of God, pray for them. God is trying to look for somebody who will give him the permission to intervene. That's what your prayer does. It gives God the permission to intervene in your life or in some other person's life. So you can come through a burden, you can come through a need. So Ezekiel has a problem. He's in a valley filled with dry bones. And as funny as God is, God says, hey, bro, um, can these bones live again? And then time God asks you a question, just assume you don't know the answer. If God asks you a question, just assume he's not, he's not looking for an answer for you. He's looking for you to ask him what the answer is. Ezekiel says to him, oh God, only you know. Then he said to me, this is the point of prayer. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, of God, Lord God to these bones, surely I will. Cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you. Cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am God. So God tells Ezekiel what to say. God tells Ezekiel what he will do. Guess what Ezekiel did in verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, as I was commanded, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. The bones would not move at the words of Ezekiel if Ezekiel was not saying what God told him to say. Your prayer has to go from what you want to say to what God has told you to say. The reason why your prayers have not been effective and working is because you've been praying what you want to pray. You've not found out yet what the I will of God is. What God says he wants to do in that circumstance. What God says he wants to do in your marriage. What God says he wants to do in your finances. What God says he wants to do in the new season of life that you're believing for. God has an I will and until you have gotten God's I will for your circumstance, you have not yet prayed effectively. The point of prayer is to download what God wants to do. What God wants you to say. The Bible says Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Remember James said it's the prayer of faith that heals the sick. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says this. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for and being the proof of the things we do not see, the conviction of their reality. Faith is perceiving as real the fact that what is revealed, that what is not revealed yet to your senses. Faith is an assurance. Faith is a title deed. Faith is a, a, a confirmation. Faith is a conviction. Faith is proof that something is real that you don't perceive yet. So the question then is this, where do I get my conviction that something is real that I cannot see first? It's what God says he wants to do. What God has said he has already done that he wants you to receive. Think about it. I have a home. I can show you that I own the home without taking you to my home. What do I do? I bring the deed. The title deed says my name is on it. On this address, this person owns this. I don't need to take you to my house. Most of you order things online. Or you order DoorDash. I like food. So you order DoorDash. And then you get the notification. I can tell you, wait until they confirm that they've received your order. And then they confirm it. That is the proof. Yeah. 
that the food that you have paid for, that is what makes you wait by your window. And every car that passes, you're looking to see if that's the one. Most of us are not expectant because we don't have a confirmation of delivery yet. You don't have confirmation that God wants to do what you're praying for. So there's no expectation because if God tells you, I want to do it, guess what? All of a sudden there's an expectation. That is when faith comes in. Everything you had before then is hope. As I said, faith is the evidence of things I was hoping for. And then I went to God with my hopes and my wish. And then he gave me his I will, what he wants to do. And as I began to pray that, faith began to arrive. So the evidence that I'm going to be healed, is not just because the Bible says by his stripes is healed. Because God has told me that there shall be no plague come near my dwelling. I know it's a verse of the scripture, but God revealed that, that in this case, in this disease, this is the scripture I want to use as a promise to you. That's when prayer becomes effective. Most of us do not get here. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 25 verse 11. It says, so will my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me useless, without result, without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. This is when your confession goes from just a generic confession that builds your faith to a prophetic declaration. You will know, you will know how close we are to the building. <laughs> when we begin to use our dresses in what we're saying. So as people walk into blah, 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 address of Rockville, as they walk up the stairs, guess why? Because we now know exactly what God wants us to have. You have to move your prayer from this generic God help me, 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 that we have on loop to God, what do you want to do? And you stay. The Bible says this. The Bible says this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to end very soon. In verse 7, it says, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7, Paul says, this is Paul writing, he says, because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelation that he had, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was sent to me a thorn in my flesh. Theologians have all kinds of suppositions about what this thorn in the flesh was. A messenger of Satan was sent to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with God three times that it might leave me now, Paul has a problem. He goes to God and says, God, help. Three times. Finally, he got the I will of God. God says to him, um, you, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in my weakness. There are two things that can happen when you pray to God about a need. He can meet the need, give you his I will for the need. Or he can tell you what he wants to do while you're experiencing it. Lazarus is sick. Jesus knows Lazarus is sick and stays where he is. Then he hears Lazarus is dead. Then he begins to move. Why? The glory God wanted from that was not a heal the sick glory. He was looking for a raise the dead glory. I know you have been looking for a job for six years. Which testimony is better? Six years or eight years? I know you need it now, but this is what getting a rima does. It's not by suggestion. The reason why we cannot last this long, because we don't wait long enough to hear what God is saying. Let me show you what happens to Paul after Paul hears, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. The Bible says this, continuation of nine. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I delight what was once a bother, what was once a concern is now a source of joy. Why? I delight in my weakness, in insults, in distress, in persecutions, in difficulty, in the behalf of Christ. For when I'm weak, I got the revelation. This was not about making me strong and taking me out of there. He's saying, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. For some of you, that's the word you need to receive. God is saying, yeah, I know you want me to take you out. I know that. But I want to get the glory from you being a child of God, even though that's your case. 
Even though that's what you have to walk through, I want to receive the glory from your life. The Bible says this, and Paul's perspective is changed. Paul's profession changes. His words change. Immediately Paul got the rhema word of God, it changed him. So the rhema word of God begins to stir faith in your spirit and it becomes the evidence of what God is. The problem is that we don't stay long enough to listen. We talk, talk, talk and we go. And if I ask you what has God promised you? Nothing. And then you become upset with God that God is not doing what you said he's supposed to do. Did he tell you that's what he wants to do? My marriage is a mess now. Did he tell you to marry the guy? <laughs> Don't go and divorce the person now. That's why you pray for the mercy of God. Because that's why he's still there. Number four, what do you do? You keep at it. If God tells you, I'm going to heal you, you keep claiming it. I am healed of the Lord. I receive wholeness from the Lord. I have the life of God in me and it reverses every sickness and disease. Every sickness and disease is taken away from my body. I am healed in Jesus' name. I am whole in Jesus' name. There shall no evil before me. Neither shall any plague come near my dwelling. God is my healer. He's the fulfiller, the fulfiller of my days. You begin to stay at it. You stay at it. Matthew chapter 7 verse 8. And if anyone keeps asking, they will receive. That word ask there is the Greek word that means to demand for something that is yours. Something that is due you. But you have to get a revelation that this belongs to you. There's a difference between walking up to somebody and you don't know if what you're claiming is yours. That when something is yours, like that's, that's my car. What are you doing? Can you sell out my car? There's, a, there's an impetus you have when you know it belongs to you. So Joshua could stand in front of Jericho with impetus knowing that God had told him, I'm going to give you this city. Elijah, the Bible says in, in, in James chapter 5, verse 17 to 18, that Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain. Elijah, Elijah then prayed earnestly that it would rain, and it rained. What you don't understand is in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, God had told Elijah, it's not going to rain. Then he had to pray about what God told him. Some of us get a word from God, and then we, we just stand up. We're done, moving on. No, you have to keep praying. What does prayer do? It keeps you away from anything that can sabotage the answer. Elijah had to pray. Then God says, it's going to rain again. He goes back to pray. If you read that story. He prays until he sees a cloud. Sent a servant, go and check. No cloud. He keeps praying. Go and check. No cloud. He keeps praying. Some of us say, I'm going to pray seven times because Elijah prayed seven times. No. Elijah prayed until there was a cloud. You pray until... Until you see what God promised you. You pray until. There's something I call the threshold of obedience. Most of us don't obey long enough. There's something in physics called escape velocity. It's the speed an object has to be to break the gravitational force of the earth. Most of us don't reach escape velocity for our answers. We don't obey long enough. But I've been doing it for one year. What if it's one year and one month? Now, for us, we like Naaman and Joshua. They knew how, how many times we were supposed to do what they are supposed to do. Sometimes we don't know how long we are supposed to keep praying. Because prayer, and I have to end with this, is a middle verb. A middle verb is when you're doing something and it affects you. You're both the actor and the recipient of what you're doing. If I say, I shaved my beard this morning. I shaved my beard. I'm both the person doing the action and the person receiving the action. Prayer is a middle verb. If what God has promised has not yet been shown, has not yet been manifested in the physical, that means there must be something God is working on you. There must be something he's trying to get in you. Something he's trying to tweak in you to make you the perfect recipient for the answer he has for you. So how do you pray effective prayers? You pray first. Go to God immediately. Don't let the devil have any foothold. And while you're there, feed your spirit. Feed your faith. Then listen. As you're praying, listen. What is God saying? What is he? What, what scripture is jumping out? You will read many scriptures. You just see that one verse or one clause that will jump out. And when God gives you what he wants to do, 
keep doing it. Keep doing it. Even if it looks like it's delayed, perhaps it will not tarry, for it will surely come to pass. If you believe that and you receive that this morning, put your hands together and celebrate God.